So, well, good morning, church. It is officially cold outside, I will admit it. Uh, and here's how much of a sap I am. I, uh, I, Fish and Tell's help, we made a little pen for our chickens in our garage and moved them in. And I put a heater next to them, and it was getting, you know, when it, when, when it would get dark, I, I would put, I put a little uh, nightlight up for them. Uh, that's just how much of a sap I am. But uh, I'm glad they're safe and warm. Um, Sometimes on Wednesday nights when I'm done, uh, finished up writing up my sermon, I'll come home and Chantel will ask me how, how it went and how I think about the sermon for the week, and I'll say, it's, it's a very Nate sermon this week. And uh, I'm not saying that's good or bad, but uh, I do think I have a classic Nate Roshan sermon for you this week. Uh, so we've got one more uh, sort of one-off before we start with the book of Romans next week. So uh, would you bow your heads in prayer with me? Uh, as we go to Lord uh, and turn to his word. Hmm. Jesus, the Lord of all, calls to us this morning. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Amen. What does it look like to trust in God? I want us to sit with that for a little while today. I find that the thought of trusting in God often comes up when times are particularly tough. Maybe we're reminded that God can be trusted when we experience loss. Loss of a loved one, loss of a relationship, loss of an opportunity. We're told God can still be trusted. And that's certainly appropriate. But here's what I'm interested in today. What does it look like? What does it feel like to trust God for the long haul? To trust God over the course of a lifetime, in season and out of season. I grew up in the church, and so I remember hearing talk of how to help young people make the faith their own. That the following of Christ needed to extend beyond the confines of a church building, going with us into our homes, our schools, and our work. No arena of life should be untouched by Christ. Nothing should be off limits or set apart. What does it look like to trust God? I'm convinced that the primary difference between those who follow Christ and those who don't is not that one group is always right, always better, always pure and perfect, and the other isn't. The difference is that Christians are people who trust God, people who take God seriously and at his word. We really do believe that he is the central reality of all existence. We really do pay attention to who he is and what he does. We really do order our lives in response to that reality and not some other. What does it look like to trust in God? It looks like taking him seriously. And that plays itself out in a number of ways, right? It means acknowledging him constantly, not just at mealtime or Sunday morning, but over the course of our days. It means reading his word. We are to be people of this book. Not just on Bible study days, not just when we're given homework. We recognize and accept that these are his words, written for our benefit we take these words seriously, for they like them or not and find them easy to understand and apply or not. They are his words. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, Isaiah 55. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. His words should excite us, compel us, move us, refine us. Taking God seriously means acknowledging that you and I are his handiwork and we live in his world. Our lives are but a vapor, a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. James chapter 4 reminds us of the brevity of our lives and the centrality of Christ. And Paul in 2 Corinthians 4, that's the chapter where Paul speaks to us about how we exist as jars of clay living so as to show the power belongs to God and not to us. It's there in verse 17, which is it's one of the most striking things you're going to find in Scripture. Paul calls this entire life 
He sums up our entire life as a momentary light affliction, preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. We lose sight of this. I don't think of my life as a momentary light affliction. You could convince me that maybe one hard day deep in my past, maybe that was a momentary light affliction, maybe a month, maybe a year. Yet we are beckoned to take God at his word, to trust him with what is so fragile and beyond our control, and not worry, not doubt. Dear Tiller de Chardin, wrote that we are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. What does it look like to trust in God? It is to put him at the center and to place ourselves in our proper position. His handiwork, his beloved, yes, he uses those words of us. And still we are not the center. This life is not primarily about us. God is at the center of all things. This morning I'd like to talk about what I consider to be one of the most vital ways that we communicate a trust in God. One of the most important ways that we can step into this story. Generations of people meant to be set apart from the ways the world does things. And actually resemble and remind people of the God that we serve. There are a number of words that you could use to describe this different kind of life. You could call it rest. You could call it being unhurried. You could call it being available to God and to others. But however you want to describe it, it is remarkably different than the way the world operates. And it is uniquely Christ-like. So I grew up in a church that taught me that my job was to live my life for God. Everything I do is supposed to be for Him. Pleasing Him, reading my Bible, Enough for him, praying enough to satisfy him, sharing the gospel enough that he would be pleased. Christianity, seen through that particular lens, becomes just as much of a rat race as the most competitive business place. We are achievers for God, earning his favor, earning rewards and good things, doing so as to get. It's all very transactional. The holiest Christian is therefore also the busiest Christian. The most righteous has obviously never taken a break. And that vision for true Christianity, it holds up pretty well right up until we open our Bibles and see nothing of a works-based, striving, never-resting, go-getter Christian life. We don't see it in the patriarchs. We don't see it in the prophets. We don't see it among the disciples. And we certainly don't see it in the life of Christ. What does it look like to trust in God? Give everything you possibly can until you collapse. No. No. That's what it looks like to trust in ourselves. That's exactly what that looks like. This is how badly we've corrupted passages like Psalm 23 that speak of the Lord leading us each step of this life. Is he our shepherd, or are we our own? What does it look like to trust in God? To take him seriously, and, and part of that is to be unhurried, and to be available, which is not to be inactive, or passive, or lazy. What I'm saying is that we ought to live lives unhurried in our walk with God and with others, available to opportunities, that God places in our path. Eugene Peterson wrote that Scripture shows us a way to work that is neither sheer activity nor pure passivity. It doesn't glorify work as such, and it doesn't condemn work as such. It doesn't say, God has a great work for you to do. Go and do it. Nor does it say, God has done everything. Go fishing. Instead of either of these two options, Scripture leads us to a life with God. A life where we participate with God in his work, but we never forget that it's his work. Examples of this are found throughout scripture. I just have three I wanted to share and then jump into a couple larger passages. Um, first, again, is, is Paul's example of jars of clay in 2 Corinthians 4. 
That we are vessels for God, carrying the gospel, the death of Christ with us everywhere we go so that the life of Christ may be revealed in us. This passage is a constant reminder to me of what people really need. Do we realize that people don't need us? They need God. Do we understand that we are his vessels? Romans 6.13 is another favorite of mine. Where Paul writes, do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather, instead, offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. The thought that we are vessels for God and we are instruments of his. We make his sound. And the parable of the workers of the vineyard in Matthew 20 I'm hoping to go through the parables this summer, and so I don't want to get too far into this and steal my own thunder, but it's one of my favorite parables um, where we learn that the owner of the vineyard, our God, for all of his desire for work to be done in his vineyard, he goes out again and again to bring more workers in. We find that he is far more concerned with having workers in the vineyard than he is with the work being done. Yes, the work is good and important and necessary, but God's true delight is having workers in the vineyard. His true delight is you. How do we trust God and learn to lean on him when we live in a society that is that so values striving and achieving and numbers and the rat race? About nine years ago, I was talking with a good friend of mine in the ministry, a guy named Brian. Uh, I've talked to you about, a f- with you, a few of you about my friend Brian. Some of the craziest stories I've ever heard in my life come from this guy. Um, we were processing through an interview that he had just had for a youth pastor position at a church in suburban Minnesota. And one of the things he shared with me from the interview was that um, he was told by the senior pastor, I expect you to be working 60 plus hours a week. And if that doesn't happen, we're going to have a problem. And also during the course of the interview, the senior pastor shared that his own take on Sabbath and rest was that he himself only took Sunday afternoons off and no other time during the week. I heard all of this, and and I I, I think I probably said it immediately. I was like, wow, Brian, interview over. Um, I have no desire. I refuse to serve in such a place and in such a way that sinful behavior is modeled and practiced by those who are to be our leaders. You and I live in a world where there are many 60 plus hour weeks. I understand that. But when busyness becomes our accepted way of life, when it becomes the desired expectation, we have lost sight of God's expectations for us. We have lost sight of the way in which Christ lived and moved and served. Our God rested on the seventh day. He did that. Our God built rest into creation in some fascinating ways. And his intentions, humanity has ignored. And we are often guilty of ignoring them as well. I want to look at two passages today as we consider work and rest and being available to the things of God. The first is a a psalm I've already preached on, Psalm 127, a psalm of ascent. This is the message translation. If God doesn't build the house, the builders only build shacks. And if God doesn't guard the city, the night watchman might as well nap. It's useless to rise early and go to bed late and work your worried fingers to the bone. Don't you know he enjoys giving rest to those he loves? These verses describe the hurried work of human beings. Building homes, protecting their cities, working our fingers to the bone. The word for house in verse 1 uh, is the Hebrew word bayit, which doesn't just mean house, it can also mean family. So the implication is that uh, human beings strive for control over every little aspect of our lives. It, it may not merely be referring to a building or a building a structure that we strive for, but the building of even just our families. I have just one question about this psalm. Why do we do this? Why do we do this? Why do we work our fingers to the bone? Why don't we 
take upon the, why, why do we take upon this work that is so obviously vain apart from God? The answer, it seems, is because we feel we have to. If the house is going to get built, if the things we value are going to be protected, if ministry is going to happen, if that person is ever going to be saved, if our world is going to stop its slide into the abyss, it will be because I strived and I gave my shoulders to the plow and my money made the difference and my candidate got voted in. Who do we think we are? Don't you know, Nate Roshan, that he enjoys giving rest to those he loves? The claim that God grants sleep to his beloved ones means that human beings can afford to relax and sleep because Yahweh God continues to be active. He will take watch. The question for us is, do you trust him to take watch? Do you trust him to be at work convicting the world of its sin? Do you trust him to establish governments as he promised to do in Romans 13? Do you trust him to bear you up lest you dash, dash your foot against a stone? Psalm 91. Hilary of Tours said that all Christians must be vigilant against what he called irreligiosa solicitudo pro Dio, which means a blasphemous anxiety to do God's work for him. Will we trust him with the things that concern us most? How will we grow in this? Because I've, I've read these verses before. I've preached sermons on all of this. How will we learn to trust God? He has to be a part of every conversation, every decision, every movement. Our faith must not merely be exercised on Sunday mornings and moments most convenient. Our trying times that send us scurrying back to God. And so I ask you, is Sunday morning your most spiritual experience of the week? I'm not saying that it should never be. But I hope for us, I pray for us. That Sunday is a milestone, a guide marker in what is already a life with God. A life of prayer and praise. A life spent in his book and spent with him. That Sunday would not always be our most spiritual experience of the week. The second passage I would have us turn to this morning is found in the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, Ecclesiastes is a book I, I hope to study with you soon. It's a book of honesty, revealing to us what is meaningless and unworthy of our time. Uh, I'm so grateful for this book. It is a book written by someone who had absolutely everything that they ever wanted and found it to not be enough. So I never have to wonder in my life, is that what it takes to be happy? But the message of the book has much more to say than just be content with what you have. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 Verses 1 through 11. I said to myself, Solomon said to himself, Come now, I will test you with pleasure. Which ought to be translated, rather than pleasure, it should be translated joy or gladness. Because there's no negative connotation with the word pleasure. He's not saying, I'm going to test myself with some devious thing that, that's not, maybe not good for me. I'm going to test myself with things that give me joy and gladness. Um, to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. It was harem. Laughter, I said, is madness. And what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly, my mind still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of trees, fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. I brought male, I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. 
I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired male and female singers and a harem as well, the delights of a man's heart. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all of this, my wisdom stayed with me. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all of my labor, and this was the reward for all my toil. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done, and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was heren. Everything was meaningless. Chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Here's why I love Ecclesiastes. It's honest enough with us to tell us all these things you want, those things that you often pray for, those goals you often strive for, all of your dreams for yourself, you can get them. You can get them. And you will find them hollow apart from God. C.S. Lewis wrote that it is, ju- it is just no good asking God to make us happy in our own way without bothering about religion. God cannot give us a happiness and peace apart from himself because it is not there. Solomon had it all, but found in the end that only one thing was important. A relationship with God characterized by awe and obedience. Pursued as a means of ultimate happiness, everything else in our world ends in fall, in futility. But when God is central in life, all of his gifts come into proper perspective and are able to be enjoyed. So, do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth, so let your words be few. We are workers in his vineyard. True and lasting joy comes when we trust him. When we trust him with our lives, what we will eat and what we will drink, what we will wear, what we will do and where we will live when we trust him with our loved ones, when we trust him with our world. A couple of thoughts for application today. Rest. Rest. Be unhurried. Make yourself available to God and to others. Remember that all the work that we are called to participate in in this life, it's all his work. He owns the vineyard. He's more invested in it than any of us are. So remember who you work for. In everything that you do, work unto the Lord and not to earn the praise of men. One wonderful phrase that I I couldn't help myself but add to this sermon uh, was just introduced to me um, a little bit ago from one of our own, April Lewandowski. She talked to me about the idea of non-possessive warmth. To be a warm and caring presence, but with open hands. That's a difficult thing for us to do. Because we work the vines, and we care for people, and when things go well, we want the credit. Even if it's just the the little hit of dopamine for doing something well, something right. But they aren't our vines, and they aren't our people. It's all his. So as we close, consider how how we can practice non-possessive warmth and availability to serve in the vineyard of our king among the people you find ourselves with this week. Would you pray with me? And I pray this benediction by John Henry Newman. May it be our blessedness as years go on to add one grace to another and advance upward step by step, neither neglecting the lower after attaining the higher, nor aiming at the higher before attaining the lower. The first grace is faith, the last is love. First comes zeal, afterwards comes loving kindness. First comes humiliation, then comes peace. First comes diligence, then comes resignation. May we learn to mature all graces in us, fearing and trembling, watching and repenting, because Christ is coming, joyful, thankful, 
and careless of the future because he is come. Amen.